Well, we are in um, a short book this morning. Um, the first three chapters of, well, there are just three chapters in the book of Zephaniah. So um, it's a short book, just three chapters, um, but it's stuffed with warnings, right? Lots of warnings in there. Warnings which are essentially warnings about ignoring the consequences of warnings, okay? So it just kind of all in there. And then, of course, the bad choices that result from ignoring the warnings. You know, we live in a place and time when um, we encounter warnings all around us, don't we? You know, you get out and drive any distance and you'll see them. Um, blind drive ahead, um, soft shoulder, thickly settled. That's a uniquely New England one, thickly settled, um, low salt area. You know, our international friends who have learned to drive have asked about those signs in particular. Um, and they'll say, well, we know all the words that, that are in those signs, but we don't know what they mean when they're put together like that. What's a blind drive? Is it a person? Um, no. Anyway, so we are surrounded by warnings. Um, it's the same in the grocery store. You look at the packaging. For example, it says, do not eat raw cookie dough. Okay, so from the time you're little, you know that raw cookie dough is the best, right? So I think that one is just too much to ask. Actually, I'm gonna ignore that. Another package warning, do not insert Q-tips into the ear canal. <laughs> so, I mean, seeing that I thought they're kidding, right? Because I thought that's why Q-tips got invented. You know, that, that's their purpose. So all these years I've been, been doing the wrong thing. Um, some warnings are more serious, one like danger, high voltage. One particular high voltage sign um, had this added below the danger part. And if that's not enough to prevent you from touching a wire fence, then fine. By all means, go ahead and see what high voltage feels like. <laughs> <laughs> so that person must have had a gift of sarcasm there. Uh, well, the warnings that are contained in the book of Zephaniah are significantly uh, more important, uh, have eternal consequences. So let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy of being together this morning like this. And I do pray that you will um, open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see you in a new way, so that we'll um, be able to see your beauty and your mercy and your faithfulness to us through the generations. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so just a little bit of background on Zephaniah. Um, the first chapter introduces him. We know he has some royal lineage in him. He prophesied um, 640 BC, 609 BC. He's a contemporary of Jeremiah and Habakkuk. He's likely pretty young, just in his 20s, when he got called, you know, by God into this role of, of prophesying to the people. Not a not an easy role. Um, chapter one of Zephaniah um, tells us. Well, he's talking and he's um, telling them about the day of the Lord that's coming, the day when they will face the consequences of their wrongdoing. He says, it's near. Okay, and so it was because that particular day of the Lord, that phrase gets used in a variety of ways, but that particular day of reckoning, day of the Lord would come to pass in just like 20 to, to 30 years within um, you know the lifetime of people listening. Um, when the people of Judah would be would be captured, um, taken into exile, or killed right there um, in their own country, and their their beautiful city was just utterly destroyed. So one thing to remember, we've talked about this previously, but one thing to remember about the Old Testament prophets is that while they saw near things likely to happen, you know, in the lifetime of their listeners. They might also prophesy about the era of the Messiah when Jesus would come. There are a lot of messianic prophecies. And then there are some like Isaiah that talk about near things, messianic times, the, the beautiful chapter, the beautiful verses in Isaiah 9. But then um, and of Isaiah, he also talks about the final day of the Lord. 
um, that great and final day that we read about in Revelation um, 20 and 21. So we can think of prophecy using that analogy of the um, telescope. <laughs> um, analogy of the telescope. And this is Sean McDonough's um, analogy, but he was saying, you know, sometimes with a, tel a telescope, we're just, we're just focused on the, the moon, you know, our nearest celestial body. Other times uh, we're looking out at the, you know, the other uh, planets in their orbit around the sun. But then there are other times when it's focused on far distant stars and galaxies. So that's the, the telescope analogy for, um, for prophecy. And so if that's helpful to you, um, use that to, to help you understand how the prophets um, see. Okay, so amidst um, all these warnings uh, that come in Zephaniah chapter two also really encourages the people um, to gather together. They're told to gather and to seek God together. And it's very likely then that Zephaniah was encouraging and reinforcing then the, the reforms that good King Josiah was trying to put forward. We, you know, we often had uh, stories, I think, about good King Josiah in Sunday school. But um, Josiah's reforms were needed and they were good. Uh, they needed some help and being re reinforced, but we know from history that they, they were incomplete. Um, but the verses that talk about that in chapter two, seek the Lord, you humble of the land, seek righteousness, seek humility. Even if destruction is imminent, there's still time to be sheltered from the calamity. Um, chapter two, verse seven B says, the Lord, their God will be mindful of them and will restore them. So these words of warning that we keep encountering are also mixed then with words of mercy and words of, of future hope for the people. Okay, so we're finally getting to Zephaniah 3. Um, and the other thing to remember about these books of prophecy, they weren't all written at once. Like he didn't, Zephaniah didn't sit down, write three chapters, give it to the scribe to get, get it mimeographed, you know, for everybody in the, um, in the, the community. Um, these were, you know, short speeches given at different times, different places, you know, over the lifetime of this prophet. Okay, but he starts off by listing the sins then of the people of Judah, um, their rebellion against God, choosing to ignore consequences. There's the biggie. Um, oppressing the poor and the powerless. You know, that the, the laws and the rules that were given um, to the people in the Old Testament um, had a lot to do with social justice, with morally treating each other the way that we should. And that was being ignored. Um, they were actually oppressing the poor and the powerless and taking advantage of widows, orphans, and uh, foreigners that were in their midst. So it's this um, list of things where they are continuously ignoring the opened arm invitation to draw near to God. So, and once again, it's an invitation that's come to them for centuries um, from the prophets. And then it gets more specific um, about the people who are supposed to be taking really good care of them who are in leadership. Their princes and government officials are like ravening wolves. The prophets are arrogant and treacherous and lead the people even deeper into sin. That's, of course, the false prophets doing that. And then the priests were knowingly profaning the temple of God. So we've heard this before, haven't we? This is that, that dark, drawn-out narrative of Israel's rebellion against God. And by now, in the semester, we're very familiar um, with this list. Um, of course, Israel had his bright spots in its history, glorious times. You know, we think particularly during the reign of King David, just glorious times <clears throat> of, of faith and courage and, you know, repentance being in there, but following after God. Um, but, you know, also reading the history of the people of Israel, that's puzzling. And, and parts of it are just even distressing to read. I mean, that's, that's the reality. It feels like these dear people who were given the light um, just can't continue to walk in the light of the law. 
Uh, people like Josiah, as we said, brought reforms, but the reforms didn't take. The people's hearts um, weren't changed. Okay, so if these uh, minor prophets, actually the major ones too, are somewhat repetitive and somewhat distressing, why are they included in the Bible? What reaction are we supposed to have um, after studying Lamentations, um, Habakkuk, Zephaniah? So what response is a book like Zephaniah intended to create in our hearts? Well, first of all, we do grow weary of hearing how these people, you know, go wandering off the path into the swamps of sin. Um, as I was thinking about this, I thought it's like reading like reading Pilgrim's Progress, but except that the main characters just, just always get waylaid. They always go off with the wrong influences, the wrong characters, and then they just never seem to make it to the celestial city. So the first reaction is, I would just call it enough already. You know, we've heard this, and we've heard this enough already. Something needs to change. Can't somebody help these people? So that's the first response. And then, because really this enough already response should lead us then to a second reaction. And that is that these people need a savior. Enough already, these people need a savior. And I think if we um, uh, read some of this on a day when we're having a bad day, when we haven't quite lived up to our own standards of how we're supposed to uh, behave in this world, um, it dawns on us that I'm not all that different from these people. I wish I was, but truth be told, um, I'm inclined to go my own way. I'm inclined to forget about God, you know, when I'm planning, making my uh, decisions. Um, I get caught up wanting things and comforts and, and security. I don't care about the poor as much as I should. I need lots of reminders. And so it dawns on us, I need a savior too. I also need to change. So that's um, really the name of the fourth reaction. So enough already is the first. These people need a savior is the second. I'm not all that different from them is the third. And then I need a savior too. And that's the fourth. And I believe actually that that's the desired outcome of reading the prophets. Um, when we discern this going on in here, we're actually discerning God's plan for the world. Um, the book of Hebrews, um, I think it's chapters 8, 9, and 10, also Romans 8, talks a lot about the in inadequacy of the law of Roman, I mean, law of Moses. The Old Testament uh, law couldn't save them, and obviously they, they couldn't keep it. So God sent Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're in Advent right now, right? Got to celebrate the first Sunday um, this past week. And week by week, you know, during, during these weeks before Christmas, we're celebrating the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love that Jesus brings to us. Well, I firmly believe that this um, third chapter of Zephaniah can actually help add to our um, Advent celebration. And let me tell you why. Okay, first off, um, verses uh, 11 to 13, the Lord through Zephaniah describes a time when the nations or the peoples of the earth are purified so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. Now that's a cause for celebration a global uh, renewal. It's describing a future time of renewal that will circle the earth. And we had hints of this renewal back in chapter two as well, which says the nations on every shore will worship the Lord, everyone in his own land. Um, just recently, my husband and I had uh, the privilege of spending time with Christians in Central Asia. And you know, at some, I um, actually have to look for words that actually capture that experience because it was amazing. And it's also humbling to be with people like that who are so joyful um, and full of love for Jesus, but they live in an environment where they are um, 
harassed, definitely harassed for being for being believers. They are an extraordinary minority there. Um, and I admired their faith, their their joy and worship. They were good. They were good singers and just, you know, really worshiped God with their whole hearts. And so we look forward to the time when people um, from every shore, it says, will worship the Lord together. Um, following on then, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3 describe a faithful remnant of Israel. So it gets back to the Israel story particularly. It's an Israel that's purified and peaceful, humbly trusting the name of the Lord. Um, the last three verses then of chapter 3 kind of go back to that theme where it talks about Israel rescued, gathered together, rescued, healed, and restored. So those verses then for, for the nations and then the verses that deal particularly with Israel really show us um, God's intent for the, the Hebrew nation and for our nation as well and for the nations of the world. Our Heavenly Father is about healing, about healing this world and making us right with him. So, but I skipped some verses, right? Um, in the meantime, there are these beautifully reassuring verses in 14 through 17 of chapter 3. One um, minister who wrote a sermon about these verses called it, This is How God Really Feels About You. I thought, that's a good title. So this, these four verses let us know that God delights in us and that he's already singing and rejoicing over us. And that we're instructed then to sing and rejoice right back. Okay, we're supposed to think of these verses. You can take them, these verses, as God's love song written for you. So let me read verses 14 to 17 from the message, which is a Bible paraphrase. Um, the reason I like the message, um, it's not like a study Bible, study Bible, but it kind of gets to the heart of things, you know, in, in a good kind of way. Okay. So here it is. So sing, daughter of Zion, raise the rafters, O Israel. Daughter Jerusalem, be happy and celebrate. God has reversed his judgments against you and sent your enemies off, chasing their tails. From now on, God is your king. He's in charge at the very center. There's nothing to fear from evil ever again. Daughter Jerusalem will be told, don't be afraid. And to dearest Zion, don't despair. Your God is present among you. He's a strong warrior there to save you. Happy to have you back. He will calm your heart with his love and he will delight over you with his songs. So take that to heart today. And back to the earlier question of our, our reaction, you know, to these uh, major and minor prophets and their messages in the Bible. I do hope we've gotten beyond the Hebrew people were very bad. So God got really mad. And now I'm very glad that this study is almost over. <laughs> Instead of that, my hope is that we've recognized their need for a savior and our own need for a savior. And my hope would be that because of that resurrection, our celebration of, of Advent and Christmas would just be that much deeper and richer. Jesus Christ came and established and accomplished our rescue by taking our judgment upon himself. You know, we've had to read this list of their, their sins, you know, in all of these um, books that we've been studying. Well, what happened on the cross? Jesus took my list of sins. He took your list of sins and they're nailed to the cross and they're finished so that we can be forgiven, those who, who accept him, we can be forgiven, we can know him as our savior, we can live free from judgment and free from fear. Come thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do love you, 
And we're so glad for your word to us. So whatever has been from you, Lord Jesus, take it and apply it to our hearts. I pray that we would be changed because we're women who have come here to fellowship together and to study your word. Um, so help us to carry forth from here the things that you would want us to and to be your light in wherever you have um, placed us. Lord, bless these good women as they um, meet together now at their tables and bless their conversation and guide them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.